Let's turn to Psalm 36 for our scripture reading. I'll read the first and the odd numbered verses. We ask you to join together as you read the even numbered verses. And let's stand as we read the word of God. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. The mercy of the Lord is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. For with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. Let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are indeed the fountain of life from which we can drink and live forever. Lord, how grateful we are for the wonderful provisions that you have made for us that make it possible for us to live in fellowship with you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you draw us unto yourself and to this place of fellowship. We thank you for the richness that comes into our lives as we learn to live in fellowship with you. Now bless, Lord, we pray the study of your word. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You may be seated. This is it. We've come to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, the end of the story. Next week, we'll start back at the beginning of the story. We're going to take a little time in the first chapter because this is basic, it's foundational. It's important that a solid foundation be laid. The Bible is God's revelation of Himself, God's Word inspired by God, inerrant. And as God reveals himself, he starts right off in the beginning by declaring, in the beginning, God. And he created the heavens and the earth. And that's foundational, that you know and understand the greatness of the God that is revealed to us in the Bible far greater than anything we could ever imagine or conceive in our own minds. And because of the importance of having this solid foundation, we'll probably take a few weeks in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Now this is not to set the pattern for the whole Bible. After laying a careful foundation in the first two or three chapters, then we're going to move on at a quicker pace, probably five to ten chapters a week, uh, because uh, I would never live long enough to go through the Bible at that other pace. And so uh, we'll pick it up after the 
uh, first few weeks, but we want to lay for you a very solid foundation. The reason being, the enemy has foistered upon the world a theory of beginnings that everything began with all of matter within the universe compressed into a small little object the size of a dried pea and that it exploded with a tremendous bang and all of the galaxies, all of the stars, all of the planets and the moons and so forth, all came about as the result of this one giant explosion about 15 to 17 billion years ago. And that gradually on this one little planet orbiting the sun, out here in the corner of the Milky Way galaxy. Matter acting on matter brought forth spontaneous generation of life, which gradually evolved into all of the life forms that we see. And from the goo through the zoo has come you. And so we want to look at the scientific plausibility of the evolutionary theory and compare that nonsense with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first verse of the book of Genesis is foundational. If you can accept the first verse of the book of Genesis, you'll have no problem with the rest of the book. That's foundational and that is why Satan attacks the first verse of the Bible so severely. Unfortunately, there are many, many even ministers who have bought into Satan's lie. Yesterday in the paper, there was a very interesting little article concerning the mainline Protestant clergy and their stand on biblical issues such as infallibility. Many take a decided non-fundamentalist view. It was a survey conducted among 7,441 ministers that were a cross-section of the major denominations. On the subject, do you accept Jesus, Jesus' physical resurrection as a fact? 51% of the Methodist ministers said no. 35% of the Episcopalian ministers said no. 33% of the American Baptists said no. 30% of the Presbyterian pastors said no, and 13% of the American Lutherans said no. Do you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus? 60% of the Methodist ministers said no. 49% of the Presbyterian ministers said no. 44% of the Episcopalians said no. 34% of the American Baptists said no. And 19% of the American Lutherans said no. Do you believe that the scriptures are the inerrant word of God in faith, history, and secular matters? 95% of the Episcopalian ministers said no. 87% of the Methodist ministers said no. 82% of the Presbyterian ministers said no. 77% of the American Lutheran pastors said no. 67% of the American Baptist pastors said no. Satan has really destroyed, unfortunately, the faith of many people in God and in the Word of God as being reliable. 
And that is why we want to counterattack with a strong foundation that we will be laying in the next few weeks as we start through the Bible again. And uh, having laid that foundation, we'll go through uh, at a more rapid pace than once we get started. But we've come now to the last book, the last chapter of the story. And we're coming to the end of the story. This morning we'd like to look at verse 17. The last invitation that God gives. And the spirit and the bride say come. Let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. And then something that these ministers should have taken note of, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words of of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in the book. In the first book of the Bible, we find the story of God creating the universe and then God creating man and placing him here on this planet Earth creating man in his likeness and after his image in order that he might have a meaningful relationship with man, in order that they might live together in a meaningful relationship, enjoying and being blessed by that relationship. But we read that man departed from this fellowship with God. By his own choice, he rebelled against the commandment of God and through sin became separated from God. You see, sin basically is the exercise of my will against God's will. The prophet said, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And if I choose to do my own thing rather than what God has said, that is sin. And so we read that Adam and Eve in the garden chose to exercise their will against the will of God and they ate of the forbidden fruit. And as the result of their eating of that forbidden fruit, they became alienated from God. The communion, the fellowship that they once had known with God was broken because of their sin. And then throughout the Bible, we find God calling men back into fellowship. God opening the door, inviting men to come back, to fulfill the ultimate purpose of their existence. Because God created us for fellowship. That is God's ultimate intention for man. And we find the Bible is the story of God calling man back into that fellowship. And so it is significant that in the final chapter of the final book, in the final words of God, God is calling still for man to come into fellowship with himself. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take 
the water of life freely. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit of God is in the world today and he is calling men to come to Jesus Christ. Jesus said when the Spirit has come, he will reprove the world of sin, that which keeps a person from coming. He will bring conviction to a person's heart concerning their sin. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Sin, Jesus said, because they don't believe in me. Righteousness, because I ascend to the Father. And judgment, because the prince of this world is to be judged. The Spirit calls us to a better life, to a holy life, to a life of goodness, a life of love. The Spirit speaks to our hearts this day, calling us to obey God, submit to His will, not to rebel against His commandments and continue in sin and thus alienated from God, but to forsake our sin that we might come back into fellowship with Him. The bride says come. The church is the bride of Christ. And the message of the church to the world is that they might come. God has opened the door for them to come. We bear to the world the good news that God is love. And that God loves man, all men. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so the church calls men to come, to come to the life that God has to give. We have good news to bring to the world. Jesus commanded the disciples to go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. And so we bear this good news to the world, the invitation to come and to receive the forgiveness of God and live in fellowship with the great God, the creator of the universe. John goes on to say, let him who heareth say, come. Once you've heard the message of God's love and you've received the forgiveness of your sins through Jesus Christ. Once you experience the joy of living in fellowship with God. You want all your friends to know the same peace and joy and love that you have found in Jesus Christ. And so you go out and you're saying to those around you, oh, come. Like the psalmist said, come and see or taste and see that the Lord is good and the invitation to come. And then it says, let him that is thirsty come. Through the prophet Isaiah, God called to the people and said, everyone that is thirsty, come to the water. He that hath no money, come, buy and eat. And then an interesting question. Why do you labor and spend your money for that which does not satisfy? You see, God is talking about the spiritual thirst that is universal and in the heart of every individual. And God is offering his water of life to satisfy that spiritual thirst. 
Now, the question is, why do you spend your labor and your money for that which does not satisfy? And yet, that is the picture of the world in which we live today. People are laboring so hard to earn money to spend on things that cannot satisfy. And there is within the mind of man that thought, if I only had and fill in the blank, I would be happy and satisfied. But that's an illusion. It's Satan's deception. You can never find satisfaction. You can never satisfy the spiritual thirst with any physical possession. Nor can you satisfy that spiritual thirst with any emotional experience. And yet, as we look at the world today, that's exactly what people are seeking to do. They're spending their money for some material possession in hopes that it will satisfy. And it is always sort of the carrot out there that you keep chasing after, thinking if I can just get it, I'll be satisfied but never able to really find real satisfaction. Oh, for a moment, for a little while, you can sort of get the feeling, oh, this is it. When you drive that new sports car out of the driveway of the dealership, that one that you've gone into hock for and you're going to have to work overtime in order to make the payments, but this is the dream of your life. And as you drive it out of the driveway and if you start down the freeway and you get on the freeway, you rev it up and you feel that surge of power. You think, yes, yes, this is it, you know. And for maybe a few weeks, maybe even a month or two, you'll feel, yes, what I've always wanted. But you know, after a while, the years go by, the newness wears off, and it's something else. And so it is through life. Spending your money for that which satisfies not. Because none of these material things can satisfy the spiritual thirst that God built into you for himself. No emotional experience. And look at how much money people are spending for emotional experiences. I don't know how people do it. I, I can't watch a full basketball game, even though it might be the finals of the NBA. I can't watch the full basketball game uh, because the, my emotions just can't handle it. I wait until the last three minutes. And there's enough emotion in the last three minutes to last me a week or so. And I think of how much money people go to see the games in order that they might have these great emotional highs, the excitement. And yet, how many, well, half of them walk away. Emotions are down. And we live on these emotional roller coasters and hoping that that will somehow satisfy. Why do you spend your money for that which satisfies not, the Lord asked. 
You see, the problem is that the true thirst is in the spirit of man. And it is a thirst for God and only a meaningful relationship with God can possibly satisfy that thirst. God said, listen carefully. You can have the good life, a life that is overflowing. Jesus, we are told, one day, the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, stood and cried to the thousands of people there on the Temple Mount, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he who drinks of the water that I give, as the Scripture saith, out of his innermost being, there will flow rivers of living water. And Jesus was talking about that thirst for God. And he said that thirst for God can be satisfied by coming to him. That through him there is that fountain of life. The water of life that is referred to in our text. Let him that is a thirst Drink of the water of life freely. And Jesus said, come to me and drink. The promise not only to satisfy the thirst, but to cause your life to be like an overflowing cup. Out of your innermost being, there will flow rivers of living water. To the thirsty world around you. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. The rich life, the full life, the life of fellowship with God, which is so rich. He didn't come to take away from you. The only thing he'll take from you are those empty things that are destroying you. Those foolish things that you have taken up that threaten your life and your existence. But the beautiful thing is even the way he takes them away is by giving you so much more. They just sort of fall off or slough off. You're not even interested in them anymore because of the richness and the fullness that you've discovered in Jesus. Those things never did satisfy anyhow. And he lets them just drop off because you don't need them anymore with the fullness that you have in your relationship with him. As we look at man in his vain efforts to fill the void in his life, to satisfy that thirst. We are reminded of the words of Jesus to the woman there at the well in Samaria, where he said to her, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. And that is true of every material possession that you've ever acquired or wanted. Because the thirst cannot be, cannot be filled by material things or satisfied by material things. That should be written over every emotional experience that you've ever wanted or had. Drink of the water but it won't satisfy, you will thirst again. But the water that I give will be like a well or a spring just springing up within, Jesus said, unto eternal life. Only Jesus can satisfy 
that thirst, that deep spiritual thirst that is universal. Hear the promise of God. And whosoever, let him take of the water of life freely. Notice God's invitation is to all of mankind. Whosoever will, the Lord said. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I love that word, whosoever. When I was a child in church, they used to sing a hymn, whosoever surely meaneth me. I am happy today and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away for the Savior said, whosoever will may come with him to stay, whosoever surely meaneth me. It surely means you. The invitation is to all mankind. God does not exclude one single person from the invitation. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's desire and God's purpose that man who has departed from fellowship with him, that he should come back into fellowship with God, that he might receive the riches and the benefits and the blessings of living in fellowship with God. And thus God has made a way whereby man could come back. As we said, the breach, the break in fellowship came with sin. When Adam and Eve exercised their will contrary to the will of God. Sin always breaks a person's fellowship with God. The Lord said through Isaiah that he wasn't deaf, that his arm wasn't short. The ear of the Lord is not heavy that he cannot hear, nor the arm of the Lord short that he cannot save. But your sins have separated you from God. You see, the problem isn't on God's end. The problem's on our end. It is our sin that separated us from God. But the problem is there is nothing that we can do to exonerate ourselves from sin. What is, is. And, and the fact that I have sinned, there's nothing that I can do that can atone for my sin, that can uh, make up for my sin. Or to make me sinless. I have no power to in any wise bring an exoneration from my guilt. And so God has taken the initiative in the removing of my sins in offering a just method whereby my sins can be forgiven. The result of sin is spiritual death or separation from God, alienation from God. And so God provided in the Old Testament under the law that when a man wanted to fellowship with God, wanted to drink of the water of life, it was necessary for that man to take one of his sheep from the flock or a goat or an ox and to bring it to the priest 
to lay his hands on the head of that lamb and confess upon it his sins and in a way transferring his sins over onto the animal which was then slain. As he held the head of the animal, the priest would slit the throat, take the blood and put it upon the altar that there might be the remission of sins. The lamb became the substitute for the man, died for the sins of the man, and thus death, the penalty of sin, was exacted, and man could then sit down and fellowship with God. But the problem was it couldn't put away his sin. And thus throughout the lifetime there would be one animal after another being brought in order to have this short time of fellowship with God. And so God sent his only begotten son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Isaiah tells us that all of us like sheep had gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own ways. That is, we did our own thing. We exercised our will against the will of God. We had sinned. But God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And so Jesus bore the guilt of every sin you've ever committed. And he died as a substitute for you. For God made him to be sin who knew no sin that you might be made the righteousness of God through him. And so God provided the means by which your sins could be forgiven. You could be washed. You could be cleansed. And thus, being cleansed of sin, being justified from your sins, you could know the joy, the glory, the wonder of fellowshipping with the eternal God who's created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. God has made the provisions. We are told in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus died once and for all in order that he might open the door and say, come. Come back into fellowship with God. Come back into the divine intention for your existence. Know the glory. Know the wonder of living in fellowship with God. When Jesus was here on earth, he went around inviting people to come. He said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You that have been laboring with the guilt you that have been laden down with the guilt of your sin. He is saying, come, come, I will give you rest. And then Jesus said, all that the Father has given to me shall come to me. And he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's promised. It doesn't matter how bad your sin might have been. How great your rebellion against the commandments of God. If you will come, he will in no wise cast you out. Jesus said, however, that no man could come to the Father except by him. He said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. 
and no man can come to the Father but by me. You've heard it said that all roads lead to God. All roads lead to some God. Because the gods of the heathen are many. And people follow a path, a road that leads to their God, which may be sex or money or pleasure. But there is only one road that leads to the Heavenly Father who is the true and the living God, the creator of the whole universe. And if you want a fellowship with him, there is only one provision that he has made today, and that's through his son, Jesus Christ. And so the spirit and the bride say, come. And he that heareth says, come. And let him who is thirsty come and drink of the waters of life freely. This morning, the Spirit of God is calling to you. The invitation is out. God is inviting you to come and to know what it is to live in fellowship with him. To experience the peace, the joy, the glory, the blessings of living in fellowship with the eternal God, the creator of all things. The invitation's out. It's up to you to accept or reject. He's left that in your hands. Father, we thank you for the wonderful invitation that closes the book, which sort of sums up the story of the book. Man who ran away from you in the beginning is being invited to come back because the way has been made whereby he can come back. And so, Lord, I pray today for those who are living in sin, those who have become alienated from your life because of that sin, those who have strayed, Lord, may they hear the Spirit and the Bride, as they call, come. Drink of the water of life freely. Speak, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to each of our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front this morning to pray with you and to pray for you. If God's Spirit has been speaking to your heart, and I'm sure He has, and you're wishing this morning to respond, you'd like to come into fellowship with God, you'd like to have the purposes of God fulfilled in your life, you'd like to know the peace, the love, the joy, the blessings of living in fellowship with God. They're here to pray for you. And so we invite you, as soon as we're dismissed, to come forward and to receive the invitation that God has given to drink of the water of life freely. May the Lord be with you and watch over and keep you during the week. May the joy of his presence be an experience that you will have during the week as he manifests to you his love, 
his goodness as he watches over and keeps you in his arms. May the joy of the Lord be your strength and your portion through Jesus Christ. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep